All right. How about that? Thanks. Let me know. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight and giving up Monday Night Football to uh, be part of this uh, public safety power shutoff program here tonight. So I want to give a quick safety message on the facility here. If you need restrooms, we've got them over down the hallway over here to, um, to my right, your left. Um, and we also have evacuation doors here behind me and out the back of the facility. And with that, I'd like to start us out with a bilingual assistance message from Simona and Kuka. Hello, my name is Simone and this is Kuka and we are here with um, Just Communities Language Justice Network to provide simultaneous interpretation from English to Spanish for this evening's event. Muy buenas tardes. Yo soy aquí, yo soy Cuca, con, junto con mi compañera Simone. Vamos a proveer servicio de interpretación de inglés a español uh, por medio del programa Comunidades Justas. A few guidelines when working with an interpreter. Please remember to speak in a loud, clear voice. This will be the signal to speak up. Algunas pequeñas guías para que sea mejor la interpretación es que hablen de una manera clara y fuerte. Esta es una de las señales para que levanten un poquito la voz. Please remember to speak at a moderate pace. This is the sign to slow down. Por favor, hablen de manera moderada y esta es la señal para hacerlo un poquito más despacio. And please remember to speak only one at a time. If you need help with equipment, we will be outside in the back. Y por favor, hablen de a uno a uno. Y si necesitan ayuda, estaremos en la parte de atrás con la mesa, en una mesa con aparatos de interpretación. And then remember to return your equipment at the end of the event. Thank you. Y favor de recordar de regresar el equipo al final del evento. Muchas gracias. Okay, thank you. So I'm Matt Pontus, Assistant CEO with the County of Santa Barbara. And like we mentioned earlier, we're here tonight to talk about public safety power shutoffs. We've got an action-packed agenda for you here today. And I'm going to start us out with a general welcome from our Chair of the Board of Supervisors, Steve Lavignino. Thanks, Matt. Uh, just really appreciate everybody coming tonight. Uh, we've had quite a few questions um, coming into my office, and I know in the 4th District. Bob Nelson's here representing uh, Supervisor Peter Adams' office as well. Um, so tonight, the main thing you want to leave with is knowing exactly where to go for information, accurate information. So we want everyone here to leave tonight with a plan of how to get that information. Um, don't leave here without any unanswered questions. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Gina Dopinto, our public information officer, and Matt for assembling uh, really all the folks here that can answer all those really tough questions that you have. So welcome tonight. Matt did tell me this was a Monday night football watching party, so he snookered me a little bit, but that's okay. I've got my phone with me, so thanks. Okay, we'll switch one of these. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Steve. Um, so with that, kind of just let me give you a few minutes here. Just let me tell you a little bit about our format tonight. We're going to go through a program update presentation from our friends at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. Mr. Eric Daniels is going to be presenting on what the program is and how it could affect us here locally. After that, um, our fire, one of our fire chiefs, uh, Matt Ferris, is going to be here talking a little bit about a public safety message from our fire department. We have a representative, um, Chief Craig Bonner from the Sheriff's Office, and talking a little bit about law enforcement and what it means for our communities uh, during a PSPS event. We have Crystal Harmon here from the Independent Living Resource Center, and she's gonna give a quick message for us. We have our OEM director, Kelly Hubbard, who's gonna be here as well, talking a little bit about preparedness and registering to be alerted should we have one of these public safety power shutoffs. And at the end, after we give those quick presentations, we're gonna invite the public to come up and to um, ask questions uh, to our panel, and uh, hopefully we can get you some great answers tonight. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Eric Daniels with Pacific Gas and Electric to start us off on the presentation. Thank you. 
Well, I'm going to be nowhere as exciting as the Lions and the Packers, but uh, I'm Eric Daniels with Public Affairs uh, Office for PG&E. I'm glad to be here tonight. I think you guys should actually get a round of applause for being here rather than watching the game. I think this is an important subject, as you must know, because you're here to hear more about it. I want to start off by, before getting into the presentation, just give you a little overview of what has just transpired in the last few days. It has to do with the PSPS, and I'll explain how public safety power shutoffs work or how they're supposed to work, how we envisioned and hoped they would work uh, through my presentation. But I'll start off by saying that if you're not familiar, there recently was, just was a very large uh, PSPS in pg and &E's territory in the northern part of the state uh, over these last few days, the last end of last weekend, uh, last week. Um, and unfortunately, it did not um, go as smoothly as it should have in a number of instances. Our communications were lacking, our, our computer uh, interface was lacking, and those are things that we recognize and will be working on to improve. So as I go through my presentation today, you're going to probably have some questions about, well, these things didn't work in the last scenario, and we're going to try to address those in the next uh, few days. So then in the future, those things are overcome. Uh, one of the things that um, I do want to relay to you was that the, uh, the outage affected 34 uh, counties in Northern California, including Kern County. <clears throat> Not necessarily Northern California, but it was part of the outage. There were three phases to the uh, large-scale outage, uh, starting on Wednesday morning and going through uh, to Kern County later in the week. Uh, restoration to the 700 and almost 40,000 customers uh, that were impacted by the PSPS um, uh, was restored within uh, 48 hours after the winds had subsided. The reason for the uh, PSPS being called was due to extremely uh, warm weather and extremely high winds through those sections, through those county areas of the 34 that I'm not going to list, um, but through Northern California. As a result of all of that, um, we had because we did impose the PSPS, uh, we did as we turned the energy back on. Uh, notice we came across at least 50, and we'll probably identify more as we move through, but at least 50 um, instances where the grid was damaged by the high winds uh, through debris falling into it or onto it. Had we not turned the power off for the duration of that windstorm there's most likely we would have had some fires to deal with. As a result of the PSPS being called, PG&E suffered no fire. Uh, uh, there were uh, no fires caused by pg and &E's equipment throughout the 34 counties that were impacted during the windstorm. So in that respect, it was very successful. <clears throat> in respects that we need to work on were a few of the things I mentioned earlier, and those are things the company is taking to heart, and we're going to work on them so that uh, we can improve our communications and improve our computer interface. Having said that, I'll now give you a presentation that I had hoped I would be able to give you today without having to have that preamble, uh, without having to have a recent event. Uh, and we'll talk a little about how the process is supposed to work and how we hope to get it to work so that if and when there ever is a PSPS called in Santa Barbara County uh, where your uh, community is impacted, uh, we will have um, learn some best practices from uh, the instances that had just occurred. So with that, here we go. Uh, PG the work, so say slide. Oh, slide. So um, <clears throat> Community Wildfire Safety Program is actually the umbrella name for the program. There are a number of facets underneath it. Uh, in this uh, instance, we have three columns that are broken out. I'm going to walk you through each of these columns through with slides coming up, so we're not going to spend a lot of time here on these, uh, but we'll um, work our way through them. So let's go to the next slide. The first instance is pg and &E setting up a weather center. We already have a weather center. We've always had a weather center. It's important for pg and &E and all uh, utilities to understand what the weather conditions are that are heading towards us so that we can always be ready for those instances. During the winter, most especially, we're always identifying when the rainstorms are coming in. When the, and when those come in, then we stage equipment and stage crews to be in the areas where we expect that impact to occur. Um, that weather center uh, is up and running. It always has been. We've augmented it in the last many months to address fire safety. 
And the piece that the new part is a wildfire safety operations team uh, to help them utilizing the same information that the Weather Center has, but also augmenting it with approximately 30, 1,300 uh, new weather stations throughout our service territory and about 600 new high definition cameras along our service territory. Am I going too fast? No, you're fine. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, I want to uh, explain that these weather centers, weather uh, cameras, and and weather uh, 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 stations are along our corridors in our service territory. So you're not going to find them just anywhere out there. We're not monitoring the weather to see about where fire conditions are anywhere throughout Santa Barbara. We're worried about that along our corridors. So that's where these things will be staged uh, and throughout uh, our system, not just in Santa Barbara County. Next slide. Uh, actually, on that last slide, we'll, we'll come back to w how the information they glean is utilized in, in some later slides here. I'll bring that back to us in a second. One of the other things that's important to ensure that uh, we don't have uh, a fire or any impact to the grid is to keep clearances around the, um, the, the lines, or we call them the conductors. Uh, recently, the PUC, our regulator, has changed the rules on us with respect to what that required clearance is. It had been, in the past, 18 inches. So around an 18-inch uh, circle around the corridor, we had to maintain a clearance. That meant no trees or brush could grow into that circle. About a year and a half or so ago, I'm not sure how much longer, this doesn't work there, but on this one, um, the PUC changed the law and um, required a four-foot clearance. So throughout the grid system, not just in PG&E territory, but all of the utilities in California, we're required to have a four-foot clearance around that. Now that's a great enhancement to safety, but you'll see on the chart there's also this 12-foot clearance. That is what PG&E's hope is in the high fire threat areas. In later slides, we'll talk about where these high fire threat areas are, and in those areas, we're working with property owners in a, in a cooperative manner to try to convince them to allow us to achieve a 12-foot clearance in those high fire threat areas. We've had some m much success with that. There are always some holdouts, but we do have some success with that. In addition, working in those areas and throughout the grid, if we come across dead or drying trees, dead or dying trees outside of our corridor that still have a capability of toppling into the lines, we will uh, address those by working with those property owners. Remember, we do not have the right to deal with those trees when they're outside of the, the corridor, but we will always try to work with property owners if they will cooperate with us. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> We've also had, uh, always had an organization that does um, uh, inspections of our grid and they will inspect the grids and uh, then we'll make repairs. We've, aug we've now, as a result of the early parts of this year when we started to impose this uh, public safety power shutoff uh, program, we uh, determined that we needed to go through, well, of course, it was court-ordered court as a result of some of the fires that we had in 17 and 18, that we had to do a wholesale inspection of our transmission system. And so we have been doing that. So let's go to the next slide. Historically, we've always had crew members uh, climb the towers from the inside, take photographs looking outward, and then send those photographs up to an analysis uh, location in uh, uh, San, uh, San Ramon. And we've always also used helicopters. Helicopters in the more remote areas would fly out alongside of the, uh, the transmission lines with a boom uh, underneath it, uh, taking pictures of the, of the lines as they went along and send that to San Ramon for analysis. We've augmented that in the last many months with uh, teams of professional drone operators. The drone operators will go to each tower, fly their drone up the outside of a tower this time, looking around it from the outside, taking photos as well, and then all of that data from those three sources are sent to San Ramon for analysis. They're looking for chinks in the coatings, they're looking for uh, rust deposits on the uh, on the structures or, and on the fasteners, making sure the fasteners are in the, or in the, uh, the, the order that they want them to be. When, and there are many other things they're looking for. Those are just examples. And when they identify uh, issues that need to be addressed, they'll send those, uh, a ticket directly to our engineering team, design a new uh, repair for that particular tower and whatever it needs to be done to it, and then the crews will be dispatched. 
So we have successfully completed the entire inspection. Uh, we have also now gone through, uh, the service planning has done all of the designs for those repairs, and the crews are now out in the fields making these particular repairs throughout our service territory. We're talking about transmission lines. Remember, there are two types of our lines. Transmission, think of more as the freeway system, getting you from one community to another. And then the distribution line is more like your surface streets going up into your neighborhoods, okay? So on those transmission lines, we've done the full scale uh, inspections. We are now turning to look at some of the distribution lines. But again, we focused in the tier two and tier three high fire threat areas, not in the valley floor where the, the fire threat is much less, if any. Go to the next slide, please. And that one I've already told you about, so we'll skip that one. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing, and this is more long term, these, this is the goal, is to work on, um, in the high fire threat area, changing out poles that are either distribution or transmission from wooden poles to metal poles to make them more robust. Also moving cross arms, the cross arms are the, the cross arms that hold the wires, moving, making them wider so the lines are farther apart from one another in certain areas of the tier two and tier three area where it makes sense to do so. It's not wholesale, but in certain areas it makes sense to do so, as well as including tree line or insulated line in the certain areas where it makes sense to do so as well. Uh, and, and even some undergrounding, although that is a last resort because of the cost and the environmental degradation it creates as we do it. But that is on the table for some discussion. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is, um, uh, actually, I think I touched on all of those, is, well, back one, is uh, long, even longer term future and more futuristic just for you to uh, be aware, is the idea of what we're calling resiliency zones. These would be isolation areas where we could have a power source within a community. So if we had to turn distribution and transmission off from that brought power to your area, we would still have, say, a battery pack uh, source within a, in, within a circuitry system that could still support that area while it was isolated from the rest of the grid. So it's long term. Those kinds of technologies are going to take some time to get to. Batteries, while we do use them for our automobiles and uh, we are introducing them into the grid, the technology is still a long way away from being efficient to uh, support large-scale uh, communities on battery source. So just know there's time will support that, but immediately it will not. Next slide, and we'll skip that slide. Um, and now the, the, tiers, the tiers that I want to tell you about where the high fire threat areas are. Here in the valley floor of San Maria Valley, uh, it's all agriculture. There is not a lot, there is no forest debris built up along the transmission lines and the, and the distribution grid uh, throughout the valley here. You may have some open fields that are full of some weeds, but they're, they've grazed them off. There, there, there are sometimes people come through and they'll do the cuttings. It's not high fire threat. High fire threat is tier twos and tier threes, and these are given to us by the PUC. PG&E didn't come up with these. We didn't decide that this is going to be tier two or tier three. The government told us these are tier two and tier three, and you will deal with these areas in a certain way. So that's what we've done. Let's go to the next slide because it draws us closer to home. So here we are in Santa Barbara County, and you can see Santa Maria and of course, the area that's colored with green and brown is just the tier one, which is not high fire threat. Tier two is the orange and tier three is the red. So in this area, again, PG&E's interest isn't to know everything about that, those colored areas. It's to know where our grid system goes through those colored areas. And under our grid, if they're in those colored areas, what is the uh, fuel source in that area? Has it been uh, allowed to, uh, debris allowed to build up over many, many years uh, so that it's an ignition source? Um, and um, what are the wind conditions that occur in those areas, as well as some other factors we'll get to in a second? The grid from, from, that supports Santa Maria comes from Moss Landing, I'm sorry, Morro Bay, uh, 
from a uh, 230 kV line that comes up to the top of the plateau, uh, just above the in, the, in the Pomo, above the racetrack, there's a large substation up there. From that substation, power comes into Santa Maria, and mostly it goes into what's the Fair uh, View substation. And then it's distributed throughout your community. And then from there also distributed down in a triangle fashion uh, down to the Buellton area that supports Solvang and Buellton and down to Lompoc that also supports Vandenberg Air Force Base. And then the two of those tie together along Highway 246 or thereabouts. <clears throat> but there's no other connectivity for that. That's the way the air energy goes. We don't connect to Southern California Edison. There's no, the wires don't touch. So your power comes from Moss, uh, Morro Bay. Uh, sorry, I deal with Monterey County. That's why I'm saying that. Um, so the concern here is for a large-scale outage would only be if we had the heat event and the wind event, and I'll talk about that in just a second, that impacted the transmission lines that brought power down into this area. Along the coast here in the cool area of the central coast, we don't where our transmission ha lines happen to be, we don't usually have those kinds of impacts. Now that doesn't mean that we couldn't, and that's why we have to let you know that there's the potential. More, more realistic would be a, a, a smaller line or maybe a, some isolated wind and heat event in, say, Sisquoc that caused us to have to deal with a certain tr distribution grid. So it would be a much smaller scale uh, outage is what the impact would be. However, having just observed what happened up north, we need to be ready that it potentially could be a much larger event. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the things that are important? That weather center that I talked about earlier and that team that is focused on fire safety, fire threat. They're looking for red flag warnings. They're looking for humidity levels in the and, of course, red flag warnings means it's very hot. They're looking for the humidity levels uh, that are in the air, and they're also looking at ground cover. Is the ground cover fuel uh, uh, in, in a state that is of, of concern? Add to those three conditions wind. If we have those three conditions and highly intense winds or gusty winds that are uh, unpredictable, uh, which they are, uh, that is when we'll get into the position of the company needing to determine that it is too dangerous, too unsafe for us to operate the grid in a safe manner. And that's when the decision will be made that we have to turn the power off. And that's what her occurred up north. Go ahead to the next slide. But it won't just be a, oh my goodness, the company's decided that the power has to come off. And all of a sudden, the power goes out. Instead, like we predict all weather, and the forecaster on the news predicts the weather, we're predicting when these, these weather systems are going to arrive. So at a 48-hour period prior to this event, we're going to have some knowledge that there's a potential that we might have to turn the power off, and we will start to communicate that. In fact, Santa Barbara County, uh, some of the elected officials did receive some notification on Sunday night of the potential for 48 hours hence, there having to be an event in this county. Uh, the th threat was that it might have been on the eastern parts of the county in the very rural areas, uh, Cuyama say, but uh, that didn't pan out, didn't fru come to fruition because during that 48 hour period, the weather center is continuing to hone in on what that weather pattern is looking like and how it's gonna actually affect us as we get closer to that, uh, that, that time frame. So at 24 hours, a new uh, evaluation is done, and we will continue to communicate. Uh, and then just before, we will also do the communication. Um, and then uh, during, and then of course when we start to bring the power back online. So let's talk about a little about these. Uh, how is the communication going to occur? You as customers, if you are a customer, uh, we have record of your, uh, who you are and, and where your meter is, and we're going to send you a notification through whatever means you've allowed us to send communications to. We implore you to go to your account online or to uh, the customer center and update your, or you can even do it over the phone, and update your um, 
uh, information. We'd like to have your cell phone, your landline, your email address, uh, and so we can communicate with you through those. We'd also like you to like our Facebook and our uh, Twitter accounts because we will also be posting communications on those sites, and if you are like them, you will receive notification that way as well. Uh, for those of you who are our medical baseline customers, uh, there is a price. We don't know who you are unless you've self-identified, so we ask you to go to our uh, uh, website, obtain the information about how you go through the process of becoming a medical baseline. You need to have some doctor's approvals for that. Uh, and then we can enter you into the system as a medical baseline. And medical baseline customers, if they qualify, will receive much more communicative effort. Uh, we will actually, if we are not able to communicate with you in the ways that we want by phoning or calling, we will actually try, a real person will talk to you. We will send somebody out to the door to knock on the door and make sure that you've received the word of that 48 hours hence, or by the time we get to you, it may only be 24 hours hence because it takes time to go through this process if we can't get a hold of you. But we will make that effort to go out to each of those uh, customers that are on that list. In addition, cooperatively working with the local OAS or emergency service personnel, they'll probably also be standing up their efforts to communicate to the people that they have on similar lists that way as well. Um, there is also another group of customers. If you are not a PG&E customer, but yet you live in the area, so who could those people be? Those would be people who, for instance, are live in a mobile home park, and the mobile home park has not been converted where each coach has their own meter. It might well be a, uh, a master meter. Most, uh, not most, but a good many of the mobile home parks have a master meter, so the owner or the manager or whoever controls that trailer park Ha is the customer of record. And from there, they have their own internal grid that distributes the energy to each coach. We don't know who those people are. We only know who the, the, the account holder is. So we'll communicate to them, and it's incumbent upon that organization to feed the information to their subcontractors or subclients. But we recognize that's not good enough. So we have a system where you can go into our website as well, or you can make a phone call, and based on your zip code, we will also communicate to you if you give us the information that we need to do that. So if you are, again, live in the area, but you're not technically a PG&E customer, maybe you rent in an apartment house or you live in a mobile home park, but you still would like to get notifications in, a, in one of these ways, you can add to these ways, whether you, you could do the Twitter or the Facebook, you can also sign up via your, cell, uh, your uh, zip code, and we will communicate to you that way. I think that covers quite a bit all of them. Go on to the next slide, please. We talked about that. Go ahead. Uh, this is the, one of the online uh, methods that one, if the system were working correctly, it started off working correctly, but because 700 and 34,000 customers were trying to get into this at the same time, plus people who were not affected areas but were curious, uh, like all of the emergency personnel down here wanted to keep an eye on how it went, um, they uh, were on here and it clogged the system. So unfortunately, it clogged it up. We're going to fix that. It's not your fault. But, <laughs> but um, because we want you to learn from it as well, and you should have been able to get there. Uh, this is where and the, the, what you would see and how you could start to monitor what was happening if you wanted to do that from your own home. Next slide, please. The next slide, I believe, talks about the zip code uh, alerts. So if you are a, a person, I, again, that is not a PG&E customer, this is your method of obtaining uh, notifications through zip code alerts. So that's pge com slash PSPS zip code alerts and sign up that away. Next slide. Uh, safety action. It, uh, these are just make sure that you have your, your own personal safety plan in place. Remember, a public safety power shutoff is a planned outage. We know it's going to happen. We communicate to you that it's going to happen, and it's incumbent upon you to take some responsibility to be ready for that. And just like as if down the street we had to take your line out for some maintenance, we let you know first of all and you deal with that outage during the duration of it. We will uh, 
treat, this is treated the same way. The danger and what, what you should be ready for is that unplanned outage. When is that big earthquake going to hit our area? And if you have a plan in place to deal with that large unplanned outage, where you haven't maybe taken the time to have your extra oxygen tank for your loved one or your extra fuel at the ready, that's what you need to really think about. And if you have a plan for that, then this planned PSPS is going to be much easier for you to handle. Can we step back a couple of slides? I wanted to mention something that I've forgotten, although now it's almost slipped my mind again. Uh, no, no, go back one more. Uh, in, in this instance, when we um, start to do the power back on, we will, again, also communicate to you. And um, the thing I wanted to say slipped my mind. I'll, I'll think of it, and then I'll throw it out at you without context later. Sorry. <clears throat> next. And then next one. And this is the end of my presentation. And just I want to note for you all some ways to get information. All the information I provided to you is in much more depth and in multiple languages in our website, pge.com. On that front page, there's going to be a, 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 a tag that says, get some more information about community wildfire safety. And you go in there, and everything we talked about with more detail is in there. So you can browse. And you can find the medical baseline. You can find the zip code, communication method, and other information. And I'm sure you'll have some questions at the end of, I think, some of the other presentations. And hopefully by then, I'll remember the other important thing I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much. So speaking of remembering things, if anybody wants to come up and grab speaker slips and start writing down your questions and, and um, getting prepared that way, we're going to have a few more quick speakers, and then we're going to go ahead and answer questions for everybody. OK, so with that, um, I'm going to invite um, our panel, a couple more panel members to come up and talk about here locally some other things that some of our first responder groups and other partners are doing here locally to make sure that we are ready and you guys are informed on public safety power shutdowns. And to start us off, we're going to invite Chief Ferris up here to give a quick message. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. On behalf of uh, Santa Barbara County Fire Chief Mark Hardwig and uh, Santa Maria City Leonard Champion, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, few things I'd like to talk about is what we discussed a little bit earlier, aware and prepare. We need you to be aware of what's happening, be ready if there's a power shutdown, be prepared for that just like you would an earthquake, and then ready, set, go. If you are in a fire prone area, make sure you're ready and go. Don't wait for somebody to tell you. If you're waiting for that person to tell you and you think it's a bad area to be in, make sure you get out of the area. That's the most important thing is that you're safe and be aware of your surroundings. You don't need to speed, which they'll talk about later, uh, or run through traffic lights that aren't working. But just be safe and get to where you're going. Let your loved ones know what you're doing. Uh, on that note, <clears throat> when you're at home, make sure you turn off your power when, it's, when the power is shut off. So when it comes back on, you don't blow up your t computer or your TV or other devices you might be using. Because that does happen. That's why we have the, the power strips that we use. Uh, as a fire department, what we do is we communicate, just like PHE was talking about, the weather. We're all fully aware of it, and we upstaff. We bring on additional engines, crews, dozers, and we work with the op area, meaning all the fire departments we talk every day during these events, and up to a week prior to, just like right now, we're talking with all the agencies of a potential event occurring at the end of the week on the front country. And we discuss what we're going to do, and we do bring on other, uh, other equipment from out of the area. We bring on extra of our own people. So, and all of our fire stations are, have generators, and we're fully supplied. We work with the county in making sure they're fueled. The hospitals are fueled with uh, fuel as well, and that's a big concern with us. So make sure you're aware of and prepared for what could happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Next up, we have Chief Deputy Bonner from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office to give a quick message. Good evening. So I've just got a, a few quick things from the law enforcement perspective. Um, the first one is, and very much like what Chief Ferris talked about, 
First thing we want you to know is that uh, all of the core law enforcement services, whether it be the Sheriff's Office, the Highway Patrol, or the Santa Maria Police Department, they are all going to continue during a PSPS event. All of our core functions are backed up. We have generators, um, and they are not going to be interrupted. You will still have police officers and deputy sheriffs and the Highway Patrol out there on the streets uh, protecting your neighborhoods. The jails will be secure and our dispatch center will be up and operational, both the, the county dispatch center as well as the highway patrol and the Santa Maria Police Department. Um, with regard to the sheriff's office, our intent and what we have in plans is that if there is a significant PSPS, we are going to upstaff our patrols in that area to make sure that there are people out there, you know, in law enforcement, black and whites, that you can see and flag down if necessary. Um, and also, if there is a significant PSPS, we will also be upstaffing our dispatch centers. And our dispatch center coordinates with the Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Services, the EOC, the call line, as well as the, the 211 to make sure that we're able to handle the various different types of calls. You don't have to plug up the 911 with a question that could be handled via the 211. So we look at the, the, the amount of calls that are coming in and decide what needs to be opened up. So a couple cute few things that, that really can help out during a, um, a PSPS. And probably the, the single biggest uh, public safety from a, from a law enforcement perspective issue during uh, power outages is traffic. Um, when the power goes out, all of our traffic lights go out. And essentially those become uncontrolled intersections and we all have to remember that those become four-way stops. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize that, that are out there driving around, and that means that all of us have to be that much more careful. And uh, I won't give you the full story, but I was in a black and white and almost got wiped out by a car that went flying through an intersection because they didn't see the stop. There was no stoplights lit up. They figured they could just drive right through it. Well, you know, fortunately, I had my, my spidey senses on and said, you know what, I'm just going to slow down here and let the car go by. And went and said hi to that person afterwards. But um, so anyhow, traffic is probably the single biggest thing. And at night, the traffic lights aren't lit. We need people to slow down, be more cognizant. And quite frankly, if you don't have to be out and about, don't be out and about. And then the other one being is, is reporting of suspicious activities, right? I mean, we all live in our community and we are the experts in our neighborhoods. And if you see something that doesn't belong in your neighborhood, and this applies all the time, but particularly if we have an extended power outage, give us a call. Flag us down, let us know about it. You know, you guys know what belongs and what doesn't belong, and, you know, we need your assistance to identify problems, and then we will go investigate those problems and take care of them as needed. So, again, we all need to, to slow down, be careful, and report things that, that are not supposed to be occurring in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Next up, we have Crystal Harmon here to give us a message from the Independent Living Resource Center. Good evening. I'm going to keep this very brief, but I am representing Danny Anderson, our executive director at ILRC. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am the community living advocate here in Santa Maria for the Independent Living Resource Center. We serve individuals with all disabilities of all ages and all income levels. PSPS disproportionately affects individuals with disabilities, especially those who depend on medical devices such as CPAPs, power wheelchairs, oxygen, and refrigerated medication. For many individuals with disabilities, preparation for an emergency is not as easy as just having an, an oh, sorry, a generator. They're not accessible. It is easy, it's not as easy to drive to a friend's house for people who don't have friends with accessible homes. ILRC has researched alternate backup power sources and can help individuals with disabilities to prepare for PSPS events. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. I have cards and brochures with me. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. 
Okay, next up we have Director Kelly Hubbard from the Office of Emergency Management with the County of Santa Barbara. Hi, good evening. So I'm here to talk to you about preparedness and being ready for whatever might impact this community, but specifically here tonight, I know we're talking about these PSPS power outages. And one of the things that I wanna mention and is we're encouraging the community to prepare for five to seven days for these outages. Um, Eric talked a little bit about the process of once they turn shut off the power, how long it takes to inspect those lines, get the power back up and running. That's after those weather conditions have abated. And so those, yes. <laughs> so the weather, maybe it's hot and windy, um, it's dry. So you have those weather conditions. We have to wait till those weather conditions are gone before they start to consider turning that power back on. They have to visually inspect all of those lines before they start to turn that power back on. So estimating five to seven days is a good window to prepare for. It's a really good window for any type of preparedness for any type of disaster. So I um, wanted to encourage that. So if you think about those conditions, that means that you have a loss of power, probable high temperatures. So think about whether or not you are sensitive to high temperatures, not having your power. It means no air conditioning, um, whether you have sensitivity to that. Think about um, what that means to your medications that might be in your refrigerator, those types of things, right? And then heightened probability of additional disasters, right? The probability that there could be then a wildland fire. And so are you prepared to evacuate? Are you prepared to receive notifications? So a couple actions here for the community. Eric already mentioned registering, making sure your contact information is current with your power utility. If you're up here, PG&E, if you're in Southern Santa Barbara County with SCE. Make sure you identify how a power outage is gonna specifically impact you as an individual. So whether that is um, access and functional needs that the Independent Living Center can help you with, whether that's um, elderly, whether you have a breathing machine, medications, whatever those impacts might be that are above and beyond normal preparedness. So you're gonna have your preparedness kit because everyone has their emergency kit, right? Your basic one with food, water, first aid, those types of things. And then what else is gonna impact you in this power outage? What is important in that that's specific to you? The other action I'd like to encourage you to do is go to readysbc.org, and that's where you can ensure that you register for notifications from the county government and other local officials. Now, some of you may have seen where we can text message. You can text your number to our um, line, like a Nixle account, and so that's great. It gets you registered based on your zip code. We'd love to still have you go to readysbc so that you can put in specific addresses additional contact information, not just your cell phone, but maybe your home phone, your work phone, your email, so that we can get to you as many ways as possible, the important information that you might need in a disaster. Um, and also we have staff out in the lobby that has um, their laptop. They can help walk you through that if you need assistance on doing that registration. We have some handouts and brochures. Also on the Ready SBC site, we have a lot of information about the PSPS events what to do to prepare, generator information, power outage information, links to the utilities, um, lots of great information. It is there bilingually, and so it is there in English and Spanish. So I encourage you to go there and look for that information. Um, and I think that's what I really want to impart tonight, but making sure you're looking at that five to seven day window, how does this impact you specifically, and then making sure you're registering for those notifications. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. So next up, I'm gonna kind of switch the meeting around a little bit and we're gonna take some questions. So to start that out, I'm gonna ask the panel members that spoke earlier to come up to the front here and grab a microphone. Um, Mr. Downs, it'd be good for you too. Yeah, there's a few spots up here. There's five five chairs up at the front there with mics that uh, they're all wired in. We're just glad you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, we do have uh, some other folks that have come down tonight, just in case you had any other questions that maybe pertain to other parts um, of some of our um, local agencies. We have Matt Higgs here tonight from County Public Health Department uh, who came down. 
We have Deborah Hood here from the County Education Office, who's here with us tonight. We have Scott McGulpin, our Roads Commissioner, in the back of the room there, should we have any questions for uh, your local roadways. And we have Roy Duggar here from Santa Maria, who uh, is an emergency manager over there. And uh, so he's here also um, for us. And we also have Leonard Champion, as you heard earlier, who's here uh, from Santa Maria City Fire Department as chief. So with that, I'm gonna call a few folks up. I'm gonna actually switch this thing around so that, uh, so that everybody can come up here. And let's start out with Fred Engleton, if he could come on up here and ask his question. Uh, my question's for the PG&E representative. Um, my question is, how, how much could a event north of the Morro Bay Station actually hurt us here in Santa Maria? Is that right? Um, his question was, I, I'm not sure if his mic was on. His question was, how, how much would uh, an event north of or outside of the county, uh, I, uh, outside of San Luis County even, affect this area? Um, it's unlikely. Uh, the power comes into uh, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties from um, uh, from to Morro Bay, from two different areas in the Central Valley, which are not in uh, Tier One or Two areas. However, the power lines, however, the power lines that come from the Central Valley to Morro Bay do go through some Tier Two and Tier Three areas. But you should know that there's so much redundancy built into that, those two lines, and that's because we often do have one of those lines out anyway. And so we can flip power from one side to the other to bring power to Morro Bay. So uh, you shouldn't be concerned that there might be an impact from beyond our two county area that would affect our uh, energy here. The concern, I believe, from this area's perspective is going to be the power lines that are bringing power from Morro Bay down to the substation north of Santa Maria and or from Santa Maria south to uh, the, the communities uh, down on 246. Okay, next, if we could have Sarah McDonald come up. Hi, I'm Sarah MacDonald. I'm a community member, and I'm just curious how we can help our homeless and our indigent population uh, prepare. Will there be like freedom warming centers open during these times for them so that they can have services rendered towards them, to them because they won't be able to have food, have food access to food? Yeah, okay. you start us out. Yeah. I'll, I'll start it although most of what you ask is going to be more of a county's response but from PG&E's perspective if it is a larger scale outage we uh, we will be establishing what we're calling community resource centers they won't be warming cent or they won't be necessarily shelters for overnight staying but they'll be uh, centers for informational purposes for those customers or anyone who needs to come and get some information there most likely will be some charging available there for your cell phones um, but it's not an emergency center per se. Uh, that'll be more of something that the local government would address. Um, I was just wondering how churches can help. Oh, well, well yeah. from the county's perspective for emergency management, so mm -hmm. on the PSPS events, we're not necessarily setting up shelters. This isn't something that we're recommending community members to evacuate or go to a specific facility for unless they're looking for information or maybe some charging um, of equipment during the day however if there is a question of other needs or services we would be looking towards our standard resources in those types of um, instances and so the churches would be a great resource if if you are associated with the church and there is a community center or a facility in your um, a room in your facility that has a lot of area for charging that's something that we'd love to hear from you about and we can work with you on identifying that as a community resource thank you sure Next up, I'd like to have Garrett Olson come up. Good 
Good evening. My name is Garrett Olson. I'm actually a resident of San Luis Obispo County, but provide consulting services for emergency and continuity of operations planning to some clients uh, that provide services to uh, vulnerable people here in Santa Barbara County. I've got five questions, so I don't know if you want me to just ask one and sit down, or no. I could go through all five. It's wonderful. Through all five. Thank you. I'll get through them quickly, and I think they're all going to be for Mr. Daniels. Uh, but I do want to start off by acknowledging the fires that didn't start last week uh, following the PSPS. The, that fact is not lost on us. Um, and we're hearing uh, some reports that fires down south uh, may have started from an electrical malfunction. Um, and we are, we are thrilled that that wasn't the reality for our neighbors that we care a lot about uh, in the north as well. Um, so I'll get to my questions. Um, I would like to confirm that since the PSPS is based on a severe weather emergency, residential customers qualify for the compensation for extended outages that is listed on the web page. Would that be a correct assumption? I, I'm not sure the specific thing that you're referring to. However, I can say this, that it's being treated as a planned outage. So any planned outages, you're being given notice that there's a potential for your power to go out. So you have that responsibility to deal with that on your own. We will allow anyone to always file claims through our claims process. And I and each claim will be addressed uh, specifically for itself. Okay. There, there is a website uh, on PG&E that is compensation for extended outages. And it, and it might be helpful just to reinform that link um, with whether or not there's eligibility uh, for Let me PSPS. look it up and speak it out later. But I believe that you, you know, if it is an extended, even if it's planned, if it's extended, I, my response would be uh, if there's an opportunity to file a claim through that, you should do it. I don't know what the results of those claims would be. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next question is closely re related. Um, what is PG&E doing to address the financial impacts of PSPS on non-residential customers? like businesses? They can file a claim on any damage that they might have had. OK. Um, how long does PG&E anticipate um, that PSPS will be necessary before the transmission and distribution lines are hardened sufficiently to meet the challenge? That's an excellent question. I should have addressed it in my uh, talk. The reason that we're doing that extra hardening that well, I mentioned at the very end there uh, is to make the system as robust as possible so that the percentage or the, the, pot the potential for having to impose a PSPS goes down substantially. All of the things we talked about are going to make the grid much more robust to withstand the kinds of winds that we're talking about. I can't tell you when that will be. Um, the first phase was the initial inspections to do the, the, the repairs to the existing grid as it is. Uh, and then the second phase is still to be determined through the PUC what funding would, sources will be available for those m much more elaborate r rebuilds being the larger cross arms, the changing mm -hmm. out of wood poles to metal poles, the tree wire, the potential undergrounding. Those things are in the distance because we're waiting for the PUC to approve those kinds of uh, expenditures. Um, and so I can't give you an answer when that would be. Okay. But the goal is, through all of this work and through the, the enhanced uh, vegetation management program, to make the system that much more robust that even when we had uh, these uh, weather events, we had more margin in where we, where we stand before we had to call a PSPS. Okay, thank you. Um, as PG&E works to harden the entire uh, transmission and distribution system, is there any work uh, happening simultaneously to shrink the footprint of PSPSs when they do occur? Oh, yes. When we get the 48-hour notice, or the, internally, we're starting to see it before it's communicated to you. And in fact, we start to communicate some of that to OESs if we determine that, that it's going to be large scale for them uh, in that particular community earlier than the 48 hours. But the 48 hours would be the communication out to the public. That communication is still going to be a much more broad understanding of what that footprint could be. By the time we get to the 48-hour implementation, we will have narrowed it some. Or in some instances, maybe have broadened it if we determine the weather has gotten worse in an area. So there's going to be some movement between that 48-hour period and the time that we actually impose. In, in addition, just as a follow-up to that, in addition to uh, making the footprint uh, based on current weather conditions, is there infrastructure changes that you're doing to um, shrink the size of the, the PSPS shutdown? By that, I would think you mean potentially the, the, the ultimate resiliency zones, infrastructure within the system so we can isolate. If there's a power line that's coming through a Tier 2, 
that supports this community here. And we have to take that power line off. If we have a method of energizing this community internally, then it, you won't have a power outage, even though we have to take that line out. So that's very much down the road, but that is the goal. Okay, thank you. And my last question, we, we've heard a lot from our county and city uh, officials talking about what they do in response to PSPS. And we saw on the news, uh, police officers out directing traffic, EOCs opening. Um, my question is, what reimbursement is available for these costs by cities and communities? Is that something uh, that you're, you're dealing with now uh, on the back end of what happened up in Northern California? Well, there there's currently is no legislation that or, or ruling from the PUC that authorizes that. PUC established uh, P PSPS's uh, capability of being imposed. P be that in Keep in mind, the public safety power shutoff is an industry standard. It's not something new to the industry. Uh, in uh, public utilities throughout, or utilities throughout the country utilize this. In hurricane zones, they utilize this uh, process a lot. Uh, in Southern California, San Diego Gas and Electric and, San Di and Southern California Electric have had this on their, as in their tool chest as a capability for them uh, to protect against wildfires for many years. PG&E has simply never instituted it. So what's new in the dialogue is only that PG&E has now learned from them and taken the best practices to try to implement our own program for implementation here. That's the only new part. So, uh, but the, the, the PUC authorizes us to do that, but it doesn't have any language in it for uh, the kind of compensation that you're referring to. Remember, this is a planned outage for an emergency purpose. So uh, those things sort of take uh, uh, that off the table. If, however, there's a declared emergency in the area by the government entities, then that opens the door for some federal support. Okay. Thank you very much. Is that not correct? If Thank you. Next, I'd like to see if Jack Owen is here tonight. Thank you for being here. My name's Jack Owen. I'm a resident of Santa Maria, and I've been involved in the public safety world for 35, 38 years. Uh, Captain Pontius, it wasn't 100 years. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed that wasn't addressed in the presentation, there's been a lot of news stories about people going out and buying uh, generators during these uh, power outages. And some things that I wanted to hope that would be included or that the chief could address is um, some of the dangers of having portable generators and even uh, maybe looking at uh, some of the local jurisdictions. If you decide now we have this new thing that's gonna affect our community, I wanna go out and I wanna buy a generator and hook it up to my house so that I can power my whole house. I mean, you can you can purchase them. And, you know, some of the things that, that maybe should be addressed is are building or electrical permits required? Can I do it myself? Uh, and some of the hazards related to uh, using the portable generators. And when your, your electricity is out, your heating is also probably going to be out. And using a barbecue pit, uh, charcoals, those kind of things inside the house. Thank you, Jack. Good to see you. Uh, yes, as far as generators go, uh, one of the main concerns we would have is, and PG&E as well, is that you do not just plug in a generator to your home. You need to have a qualified, certified electrician install that for you. Uh, there's many dangers with doing it yourself, and a permit is required, but I believe that uh, mm -hmm. Pontus, Matt Pontus is working with the county to streamline that uh, process to cut it down. Some of the dangers with that are when the power, you energize your house and it's not done properly, it will backfeed into all the power lines and possibly cause a fire or injure somebody on down the line by re-energizing the lines. So that's one of the main concerns with that. And another concern was the uh, bringing in uh, barbecues and other equipment like that to warm your house or to cook. That's something you do not want to do. The gases that are set off by that will kill you. You have to be very careful with doing those type of things. Make sure you conduct those on the outside of the house. Mr. Daniels, you want to talk about your website and the yeah. messaging you have there? We do have in the website. I can't tell you the exact location, but again, if you go into pge.com and go, you'll see the link right on the front page about the wildfire safety program or public safety power shutoff. 
once you enter into that, you can search your way through and find a link or uh, some pages regarding uh, generators. And they are, we don't give recommendations on what you sh should buy or go buy if that's what you want, but it's how do you utilize them safely. And the important things are what the chief just made reference to is uh, you're not powering your own home unless you're buying a very massive system and that's a whole different uh, uh, situation. But if you just want a localized uh, en generator to support your, your refrigerator or, or something small of that sort, there are ways to do that safely and we have some of that information for you so that we encourage you to uh, follow the instructions that are provided to you so that, and, or hire somebody who can show you how to do it correctly. And Thank I just wanted to add to that, um, the Independent Living Resource Center, so if you have access or functional needs and a generator might not be the easiest for you to turn on or connect, the Independent Living Cent Resource Center is doing some research into which generators or types of backup um, batteries, equipment might be most um, easy for various people of different capabilities to utilize. And so if you do have concerns about that, and that can include even just they can be heavy. Um, reach out to the Independent Resor Living Resource Center and they are looking into some of that information. And then to add to the barbecues also is careful with candles. A lot of people, I saw a lot of pictures of people lighting candles all over their houses and that's another concern. Go out and buy your camping, you know, lantern, flashlights, have those around the home, not leave a bunch of candles burning around your home as well. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Owen, for bringing that point up. Uh, next up, Artine Miller, if they're here. Hi, I'm Arlene Miller. I have a question for PG&E. I live in Epalmo, and we've had the power lines go down a couple of times because people plant those really tall Leland Cypress and a lot of them are dead and we had a fire the last time the line went down and I was wondering why people aren't required to take care of their own property because it affects everyone well I can't comment on that part of it <laughs> but I can say that we uh, do want to know about customers concerns regarding uh, vegetation mm -hmm. and there is a method that we can collect that if you stay long enough I'll get your name and number and information I'd like to chase that down for you okay. um, but um, just to to, to, just to speak more broadly on the topic, the right tree under the right place is an important concept. Please consider where you're planting trees, if you're planting trees, that the tree that you've chosen is not one that will grow into the power lines and then require uh, the utility to have to do some pruning to it. Try to find locations where that won't occur. Uh, in instances where, as you suggest, the trees are already there, have died, and are now potentially of danger, we do want you to report those. You can call 1-800-743-5000. Uh, That's 1-800-PGE-5000 to report any kind of a concern like that. So, But I'll talk to you afterwards so we can get a more clear picture okay, where this is. there should be a law because it's been going on for 30 years. The other question I have is to the I'll fire talk. department. I'll, I'll tell her okay. in a second. Go ahead. Okay, the fire department. I can, I'm concerned with the community wells, the children. Do the wells have a, a backup if the power goes out for the water, water system? Water systems. I can't speak for Napomo, mm -hmm. uh, but I do know all the communities around here do have power generators to supply power. Oh, or good. Okay, power I'm, water. okay. Thank you. It's typical that most do, but they may not. You should ask your I own water it. purveyor. Okay. The phone number uh, the lady asked is 1-800-743-5000. Okay. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arlene. So next, Chris Cycling, Cycling. Uh Chris Cycling. <coughs> Well, as you know, there's recently been some terrible fires in California, and one of which was in Malibu. And my daughter lived there, and uh, she lost her house in that fire. It, it burned completely. And while, while they were evacuating, the fire truck rolled up and tried to hook into the fire hydrant, which was right in front of their house. And guess what? No water. The local authorities, when they turned the power off to everybody, they also turned the power off to the local pumping station that supplied the fire hydrants. And I'm wondering, are you, do you have any connection with uh, 
making sure that the that the uh, <coughs> fire hydrant pumps are, are supplied with electricity during an outage. PG&E often coordinates with local fire operations whenever there's a fire in an area, and we will turn the power off if it's deemed safety for, uh, under safety that, that the fire department would like us to do that. We'll also return the power uh, through a process that we have to go through uh, if they request it. So we do do a coordination with the fire departments, but I believe the chief has more to say on that. I'm yeah, but there's, there's quite a, there was a number of houses in Malibu that were lost primarily because the fire hydrant right in front of their house had no water to it. Yeah, I heard you. So one of the things that we do here in Santa Barbara is at the Office of Emergency Management is we coordinate with all the water and wastewater utilities to ensure that we have that um, communication with them so that if they do have power issues, so they lose power just like everyone else, we do too. So we're working with them to make sure that they have backup power and make sure that they have a program and that they're ready and prepared to continue to provide their services. And then if they start to have issues, if they start to have problems, a generator breaks down or something of that okay, nature, so they work I, with us. I just us. wanted to make sure you were mm -hmm. aware of this problem. Yes, so we've been working yeah. with a lot of different okay. community providers mm -hmm. of services. Okay. Yep. As far as communication with people, uh, the, the good old-fashioned way, everybody in here owns a car radio, mm -hmm. and uh, our local our local uh, radio stations can can communicate with everybody instantly. So, <laughs> yes, you. if we do impose do have to do a PSPS that 48-hour period, our media team will start communicating with all of the media outlets as well, mm -hmm. and you will hear it on that source through those sources, TV and radio as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, I'd like to invite anybody else up to the uh, microphone that may have a question on PSPS at this time. It's not often we have, oh, sir, would you like to come up? If we could get you to come up to the microphone so that we can capture it on our TV for folks at home, that'd be great. Good evening, I'm Glenn Battles. This is for Mr. Daniels. Do you have a, a critical factor of the wind speed, temperature, and humidity that is going to start this process before it gets critical? It's a question asked all the time, but there isn't one recipe because it'll always be determined on the location where we're talking about what the district, what the lines are that we're referring to, whether they're a 500 kV lines or they're a 4 kV distribution grid. All of those factors go into a certain, uh, into determining whether or not a PSPS has to be called for that particular area, as well as all those weather conditions. So it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, and there's no methodology of the terms that I can give you here that would satisfy that question. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Does anyone else have any other questions that you'd like to bring up to our panel? We found uh, Dave Clary, my wife and I live in Tepesque Canyon, and um, we had a small fire that fortunately the fire department got on very quickly. Great. <laughs> And, uh, but we have a telephone tree to nor notify everybody about this, and there's also a hotline. But what we found is when the electricity went out, most, a lot of us now <coughs> have computerized phone systems. They're not hard landlines. So what that means is, in effect, unless people have a backup generator, as we do, uh, and a handful of people do, not, not everybody, there's really no effective way to communicate. So what that means is radio, uh, when people can have a battery-operated radio, is local radio is going to be incredibly important for the communication. That's all I wanted to say. And if I can add to that, if you um, have your phone lines through your cable provider, and so it's often through a modem, the cable companies and the communications companies, we've talked to them about what backup power they have in place to keep their systems up and running. But your modem at home wouldn't have backup power unless you selected when you got your service, you might have selected to get that backup battery or that backup power that was a little extra in your monthly bill. And so you might want to go back and look and see if you did that. And if you didn't, reach out to your communications provider, your cable company, and see if that's a resource that's available to you and um, whether there's any cost associated with that to help back up your phone lines. Yeah, a lot of us have a satellite because just cable's not available. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, next, anybody else have any questions? All right. Not seeing any, I wanted to kind of throw out one, one more message. Like uh, Director Hubbard mentioned earlier, we have a booth set up outside the board chambers here with additional materials on uh, registering for alerts. We want to make sure that everybody leaves here tonight uh, with at least the web address for readysbc.org so that you can register with us. Uh, we're going to be following um, PG&E's messaging um, with the Office of Emergency Management and want to make sure that uh, if you have any other questions for other our partners here, we've got Highway Patrol here in the house tonight. If you have any uh, main thoroughfare roads questions and uh, and a lot of other partners here. So thank you for being here tonight and we'll be sticking around a little while longer to um, field any questions that you may have. Uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, with that, um, I would stay tuned to readysbc.org. Thank you. <laughs>